Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero, and last time we met, I, well, last time we met in the context of Breaking It All Down as opposed to the, the Nintendo Power Ridge perspectives, I mentioned I'd talk about the other games that I got from my 3DS when I got it. In particular, I got the Etrian Odyssey games uh, that came out for the 3DS, particularly Etrian Odyssey 4 and Etrian Odyssey, the, um, Etrian Odyssey Untold the Millennium Girl. I also picked up uh, to the Shin Megami Tensei games. But as I went through thinking about what exactly I was going to say about these games, I kind of came to realization. I just don't want to talk about these games. I, I mean, I want to talk about them, but I want to talk about just these games. Um, because as I was going through all of this, I also was listening to some old issues, the episodes of the Giant Bombcast, because we lost Ryan Davis this past year, and I've kind of been saving up his last episodes, because I wanted to... I didn't want to reach the end of them, you know? Anyway. Um, so I was listening to their E3 2013 coverage, and they were talking about the Wii U and the Wii U's lineup. And I was thinking, you know, the Wii U could be a really great system for role-playing games, in the same way that the 3DS and the DS before it were really great systems for role-playing games. Not just because... Not just budgetary related stuff, because the 3DS has the advantage of it's a smaller system and has lower hardware cap uh, hardware capabilities. So, when all said and done, you can make games for less on the 3DS than you would take to make a game on, you know, Xbox 360, as far as a full, big budget, on disc release, on the Xbox 360, on the PlayStation 3, that sort of thing. Um, but, from a presentation standpoint, the 3DS does some really interesting things for role-playing games. It kind of helps maintain a sense of immersion and makes it easier to manage information. When One of the things with playing old role-playing games, and this is something I've observed, just playing these titles in general for an article I'm working on for Hardcore Gaming 101, both current ones and previous ones, as well as for, well, um, just my own entertainment and for Nintendo Power Retrospectives, is the certain degree of menu juggling that comes up in these games. Going to subscreens to change equipment, to check your equipment lineup to see uh, if a weapon is better, or to equip the new gear that you that a monster dropped in the dungeon, or any a numerous number of things um, that can happen in a role-playing game that you need to do. Same sort of thing came up recently when playing Skyrim, or uh, Borderlands 2, which I got for Christmas. Uh, from the Steam sale. And this all got me thinking. Um, the three, the 3DS and the Wii U both have second screens um, with touchscreen capability. And from an interface design standpoint, this is ideal for role-playing games. Uh, great example for Etrian Odyssey is Etrian Odyssey, if you haven't played it before, is, it's a series of old-school dungeon crawlers. Um, basically designed after games like the Wizardry series or Might and Magic, or that sort of thing. More on the Wizardry side in terms of going through a big, massive super dungeon than outside exploration. And with these games, um, back in the old days, when you're playing them on your PC in DOS, or it was an Apple II, or, TR or Trash 80, or Commodore 64, or whatever... You'd be making maps on graph paper. The same thing when for when these games were ported to consoles like the NES. You would have to draw out the maps yourself with graph paper. It's kind of an accepted fact of the thing. You'd be taking notes and all this other sort of stuff. Uh, now, with a portable game, that's actually not as feasible. The reason being is you're taking your DS or your PSP or what have you, your Android phone... Um, around with you. You're not always going to be at a place where taking out a notepad and paper and drawing maps is feasible. I mean, to put this in a different perspective, okay, if you have graph paper near you, go and 
pick it up, and then kind of sketch a map on graph paper, all using only straight lines, sitting here at your desk. Pause the video and do this. Then, as for part of this thought experiment, go out somewhere and do that in a park, on a bus, somewhere, while holding your phone in one hand, or something else like that. It, it's tricky to do. Just the sheer logistics of having to kind of have your leg up and stable the notepad, stable his notepad while having the console, having your, your phone in one hand, and all this sort of thing. It's especially not feasible on the bus, particularly there's lots of passengers, because the guy next to you is going to be kind of irritated with the fact that you're crossing your legs to stabilize your notepad and kicking him in the in the knee while you're trying to play your game. It's you know, some logistics of the thing for a portable system. So, for Etching Odyssey, the brilliance of all of this is you still draw your map, just like you would have done back in the good, bad old days, or good old days, depending on your take on the whole thing. You're still drawing your map, but now it's a situation where you don't have to worry about, you know, the logistics of it. Um, other games, like the Class of Heroes games, which I... Kick, tried to kickstart, it failed, but I tried to kickstart, and I got... Kickstarter got enough demand that I've got a physical copy of Class of Heroes 2 as well. Um, but in any case, games like that, or the Wizardry release for the uh, PS3 on PlayStation Network, um, the games have a map-making system in there. You're not drawing the map, it automatically draws the map as you explore the dungeon, but it does that. Um, it's not the perfect option. Um, my com one complaint with that is with Etrian Odyssey, I don't have to walk through a hex to get an idea where something that there's a wall there to measure distance. Whereas with the OSG games, you have to go through every hex, even if it's clear, oh, there's a trap there, or it's a darkness hex, or what have you. Um, but I digress. Uh, so with the 3DS, it really works very well for doing the dungeon crawl style of gameplay in a fashion that is feasible for players new to the genre and old to the and old hands in this genre because they have you have the map always with you. You don't worry about losing graph paper, and it's going to be generally fairly accurate, um, and that sort of thing. Um, even the Dark Spire, even though it doesn't mark your position on the map at all times, uh, it draw, automatically draws the map based on where you've been in the dungeon. You don't have to worry about messing up your map. It, it's great. I love it. So, um, this works great with, with the uh, 3DS, and this led to me thinking, when the Wii U was first announced, is, are we going to see a Etrian Odyssey game for the Wii U? Because the Wii U has a second screen, just like the 3DS. And I don't believe it's a capacitive touchscreen, and I think it uses a stylus, which, in its own way, works just fine for doing dungeon mapping, uh, doing map making during games. And then this led to me think about other things, because one of the things I've encountered when playing Skyrim, for example, is I go around the world, I find an item, pick it up, and then spend a while hopping through my inventory trying to figure out which... Um, well, which weapons it's better than. Um, I, maybe I'm using a two-handed sword right now, and it's not as good as the two-handed sword that I'm using, but is it better... But if it's a long sword, is it better than my current best long sword? As an example. Um, similar sorts of stuff like that. Also, it makes takes the pain out of inventory management, and to a certain degree, can actually up the difficulty if, if you were to do... Skyrim on a system with a second screen, like the Wii U, and handle move all the menu stuff to that second screen, it would it would basically make menu management more organic. Long story short, um, to a certain degree, um, with like the Xbox version and the PC version with Kinect integration, they've tried to do things to kind of integrate this and make things work make things a little more seamless navigation-wise through voice integration. For example, I believe they patched into the Xbox 360 version of Skyrim and the um, 
PC version, if you're using Connect, the ability to actually say your Dragon Shouts. So instead of having to tap, a, instead of having to pre-program your thing to do Fusro Da, and have it set to a hotkey, you just say it. With also the advantage of every Dragon Shout is at your fingertips or tongue at the tip of your tongue, as opposed to having to navigate menus to hotkey the darn thing, which is great. Um, and that's wonderful. I love it. However, having a second screen, um, so that you never have to wait for menus to load, you can just pop down and scroll through it, it's always there, is great. It keeps you in the action longer. It keeps you in the world longer, as opposed to in the game interface. And it also... I, I mentioned it raises your difficulty in the sense that if you do it right, when you're on the menu, the action on the top screen doesn't pause. It's sort of like what was done with Zombie U. So you can't. So it, it removes the little crutch, depending on how you want to implement it. This would be an optional thing. It removes the little crutch of I'm going to pause the game, go to a menu, drink five healing potions, and eat a small um, all-you-can-eat buffet's worth of roast chicken or what have you, before returning to combat after now my health is completely replenished, to continue beating on the boss that I'm fighting. That's how it stands now. With the second screen, that goes away. It can it ups the difficulty in a subtle in a subtle fashion by requiring players to change their playstyle, but it doesn't change the mechanics very much. Which is a good thing. Changes in difficulty that don't change the mechanics, that don't um, break what's not broken already and doesn't need to be fixed, is a good thing. They're good things. Um, so that's that's the main thing I wanted to bring up uh, with talking about the 3DS games I picked up recently, um, the Dungeon Crawlers, and also talking about things I'd love to see on the Wii U. Uh, brief thoughts on the games in question anyway, just so I can get that out there. Since I can't really do screenshot reviews of 3DS games. Um, Edge and Odyssey 4 and Untold of the Millennium Girl are excellent. Uh, Millennium Girl is a retelling of the first game. I actually like it more than the actual 3D, uh, the ex uh, classic DS version of Edge and Odyssey 1, in part because while the story is the same... And the dungeons are... When the dungeons are tweaked, they're bigger. Um, they're not exactly the same. Um, the quests you get in particular orders are the same, but things are in different places. But also probably the, bigger, the biggest change for the best, for the better, is, well... You see your skill tree. You see how the skills evolve for the various classes. All the character classes from the first game are still there. Um, they all level up in pretty much the same way. But you get a better sense of progression of ability to ability to ability, which gives an idea of how you're going to plan how your character progresses and how you build your character. Echinazi 4 is excellently done. It is, um, it is the best console version of an old school hex crawl I've, I've seen that's not related to either the Might and Magic series or the Elder Scrolls series. Um, and I was actually going to redo my video about talking, uh, tabletop role playing games and giving, on what game recommendations for tabletop games I'd give based on video games that you like. I would probably say when it comes to the hex crawl play style, I would probably include, um, rather than just focusing on the Elder Scrolls alikes, I probably would toss the Etrian Odyssey 4 in there as well as a recommendation. I also, um, really enjoy the two Shimigami Tensei games I, I picked up. Um, with Soul Hackers and Shin Megami Tensei 4, they're two very different games tonally in terms of types of stories they tell. Um, but gameplay for both is solid. The dungeon crawling in, in Soul Hackers is more of the sort of Etrian Odyssey 
Dark Spire first person blocky dungeon tile exploration style as opposed to uh Edge of Nazi 4, which is kind of real time ish. But they both work really well. I'd say that I like the implementation of the street pass in Shin Megami Tensei 4 more than in Soul Hackers. Shin Megami Tensei 4, it's kind of implemented like Pokemon Street Pass trading, or Pokemon trading via Street Pass, uh, whereas in whereas in Soul Hackers, it's kind of you're leveling up a sort of in-game shop based on who you Street Pass with and that sort of thing. It's clunky, it doesn't work as well as I'd like, but anyway... Um, so that's my thoughts in brief about those 3DS games. Um, if you're looking at the HD and going, hey, is that a copy of Nino Kuni at the top shelf there? Yes, it is. I may play and do a review of that, or a Let's Play, or what, ha- or what have you. Uh, in the meantime, well, I'll talk about something else in two weeks. I don't know what yet, but I'll see you then. Mm-hmm.